Hi, Jim here. Thrilled that you've joined us today. Between fifth grade and eighth grade, I got the chance to do a paper route. Now, I love being a paper boy. I love being a paper boy. Why? Because it gave me extra money to spend on things, anything I wanted. It also gave me some freedoms. In the afternoons when I was delivering papers, I was riding all around town. It felt like I was so mature. I loved that feeling. And it probably went to my head. About six months in, my deliveries were getting later and later and later. I was spending my time at friends' houses. Instead of doing the paper out like I was supposed to, I had decided that it would be better just to hang out play games, and have some fun with my friends. The papers got delivered later and later, and some people got angrier and angrier. At some point, my mom found out, and that was bad enough. But when she asked me, Jim, why is everything getting late? Have you been doing other things besides the paper out? I lied to her. I told her, of course not. I was just being slow. I don't know how she knew, but she knew I was lying and she knew who I was with. That choice broke our trust. In fact, it took a long time for me to dig out of that hole. Every time there was a question of, was Jim lying or not? She assumed I was because she had caught me in a lie. I broke trust. Starting this week for the whole month, we're going to be talking about trust. For the preschool, it's learning that Jesus is a friend we can trust no matter what. In elementary, we're talking about living that trust out. That's called integrity. Being the person who's worthy of trust. I'm excited for what this month is gonna bring. Well, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you could be with us on this World Communion Sunday. And yes, uh, the table is here before me, and I have a guest that will be uh, uh, providing us an opportunity to uh, learn about what it means to have communion in a virtual sort of way, in a much different sort of way. And so I invite you to stay tuned for all of that. And uh, we do have a guest speaker today, but before I introduce her, I wanted to just remind you that uh, we are again this year are going to be collecting shoe boxes for Christmas, Operation Christmas Box. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, we want to encourage you to pick up your boxes. There's plenty of them here. If you'd like to uh, bless a child this year, we encourage you to uh, participate in that in that way. So thank you for doing that. Uh, this is, like I said, World Communion Sunday, and on World Communion Sunday, we try try to reflect our faith tradition by connecting with people outside of ourselves. It is my privilege this morning to welcome two. Uh, to the Salta Cross community, to the Salta Cross Presbyterian Church. We have uh, two uh, friends of mine now that I've met today because this is the days of COVID. We don't get to meet very often, but the Reverend Cynthia Jer will be our soloist today. Thank you so much for sharing your gift with us. We know it will bring glory to God. So thank you for sharing that with us today. And then the Reverend Dr. Carita Kane Grizel, thank you so much for being here. Uh, they're from the Murph Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in North Highlands. If I got that right, you can correct me later during the message. Say, Pastor Bob didn't quite get it right. But, but I am so uh, glad to have this connection, and especially on World Communion Sunday, which brings us all together. We are in one place under the crown of Jesus, and we serve the bride of Christ that way. And it is my privilege to be able to uh, open our time together with a word of prayer and thanksgiving and uh, celebration to say we are grateful to God for the gifts of the church. Would you join me, please, as we join our hearts together? Great God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth. And today, Lord, we thank you for special gifts, gifts that come to us by way of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the gift of music that opens our hearts to your word. And I look forward today to uh, 
Dr. Grizel's message for us because I know it is for us today to open us to your word, to expand our understanding of who you are and how big your church is. And so we give you the glory, and we thank you for this, and we offer this prayer. The name that is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is what I do when I want to be close to you. I lift my hands in praise. Praise is who I am. I will praise Him while I can. How blessed. And I vow to praise you Through the good and the bad I'll praise you Whether happy or sad I'll praise you In all that I go through because praise is what I do. Cause I owe it all to you. Praise is what I do. Even when I'm going through, I've learned. stand a chance my praise outweighs the bad and I vow to praise you through the good and the bad I'll praise you whoever have me or sad I'll praise you in all that I go through because praise is what I do cause I
Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have spared our lives and allowed us to come together once again to worship you and to praise your holy name. And now, oh God, we ask that you will just touch us right now in the name of Jesus. Oh God, wherever we are, oh God, touch us and touch us who are in this place, oh God. We pray, oh God, for the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit to be in us, around us, and all about us. Touch these lips of clay, crucify self, and hide me behind the cross that I may preach the unspeakable riches of your glory. And we'll be so thankful and so careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. I'd like to read for your hearing the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 20 to 24. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may also be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be one, as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world. To Pastor Bob and First Lady Patty Yule, to the elders and deacons and other officers, sisters and brothers in Christ, I bring you greetings from Murph Emanuel, African Methodist Episcopal Church. It is indeed a pleasure to have this marvelous opportunity to speak to you on this World Communion Sunday, a day observed by most mainline denominations that began in 1933 by Pastor Hugh Thompson of Shady Presbyterian Church. Its purpose is to to promote Christian unity, celebrate the Eucharist, receive inspiration and information, and most of all, to know how important the Church of Jesus Christ is and how each congregation is interconnected with one another. The other day, I was listening to the beautiful song, We Are One in the Spirit, We Are One in the Lord. I wish I, I'd try to sing it, but I don't want to make a mistake. And it goes on to say, and they'll know we are Christians 
by our love, by our love. And tears just well down my eyes and my face because when we look at this world, our nation, and our communities, we are so far from it. So looking at verse 23 of John, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I want to talk on the subject, one in the spirit, one in the spirit. As I just said, we are so far from being one in the spirit as human beings or even as Christians. Can I really tell the truth and shame the devil? Look at the way we treat each other. Disunity is everywhere. Racism is running rampant. Folks are not what God has intended for his people to be. We are all share the same bonds of birth, bionics, brains, and behavior. We all share the same burdens. Blots, blemishes, blames, and battles. We share together the same time-space continuum, which we call Earth. But we as human beings can't seem to be unified in anything. Overacted egos that gets in the way of our relationships. The desire to always be one up on somebody else. Always want to be the show, be on top, to sit on the throne. Because our enemy, Satan, wants to divide and conquer. And right now it almost looks like he's winning. But I thank God that God yet sits on the throne. Isn't it interesting that when we look at what sometimes is called the last will and testament of Jesus Christ in our text, that he is praying for what I will call a supernatural oneness of God. This prayer of John 17, prayed by Jesus just prior to his death, is often called the high priestly prayer because he intercedes with God on behalf of his disciples. Present, oh, and what I like about it, he prays for us too. He prays for the future. And it is important for us to understand that, that Jesus is praying not only for his disciples, he's praying for those who will come after. He's praying for us. He's praying for you and you and you and you, and he's praying for me. Hallelujah. That means that we ought to think of this prayer as the Lord's prayer rather than our Father's prayer because this prayer is what when Jesus was pouring out his heart. The Our Father prayer is, would be better called the model prayer or the disciples prayer because it is a prayer that Jesus gives to us to pray. Jesus was so, he wanted us to, to, to come together and be as one. This John 17 prayer represents Jesus' provision for his disciples' needs on the eve of his death. The state of being one in the spirit is what he wanted for his people 
means oneness, the quality of, of being as one singleness, the condition of, of being undivided, wholeness. And here we find Jesus, the spotless lamb of God, taking the time to pray for you and me. It is said that, that he prayed for the weakest as well as for the strongest, for the diseased as well as the healthy, for the orphan as well as the children of the family, for the prisoner as well as for the free, for the most undistinguished, unremarkable believer, as well as for the believer in the limelight. Oh, aren't you glad that Jesus prayed for all of us, every one of us who, who believes today? I can imagine that as the disciples gathered for what would be called that final meal with Jesus, although they did not know it at the time, they did not feel anything like oneness. They were, I'm sure, frightened, uncertain, insecure, scrappy, and squabbling. Peter was pestilent. Judas was plotting. And James and John were probably still jockeying for promotions. Did it change after the ascension? Probably not. Having been a part of the, the church for many years, I want to remind you that that this describes some folks in a lot of churches. I know not here at Celtic Cross, but Jesus prayed that the believers may be unified in the love of God, that we all might be one. And I am so glad today that we can come and share with Celtic Cross Presbyterian Church. I'm looking forward for Reverend Yule coming to Murphy Manual. And what we are doing today and what I pray we will continue to do is kind of what is the central theme of this prayer that Jesus was praying. Jesus prayed that believers be one, unified, one in spirit and in mind, in proclaiming the central message of the gospel. When you think about it, it's mind-boggling. His prayer was not for the disciples alone. His prayer was also for those who would believe in him through his message, that all of us may be one, and I hear him saying, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in me as I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the one central message, I believe, not two, not three. And the message is that God sent Jesus out of heaven into the world. There is only one request of his people, not two, not three, to believe that God sent Jesus into the world. There is only one message that his followers be as one, unified, and proclaiming the message of the glorious gospel. For how can we expect to reach a lost world if we are fighting among ourselves? Does it mean that we all have to agree? No, we must be able to disagree without being disagreeable. We must be able to discuss our differences face to face. We must be able to let go of minor hurts and, and pointless disagreements. In other words, everything we do in our lives must be done with a view of maintaining unity in the body. 
We are one in Christ whether we agree or not. To become a part of Christ is to become a part of the community, a part of the one. And it is a prayer that focuses on our unity, on all of us being as one. In fact, the standard for unity is oneness between Jesus and his Father. Believers are to be one just as the Father and Jesus are one. That very same kind of unity that exists between the Father and the Son should be the same kind of unity that exists among believers. The purpose for this unity is that the world may believe that the Father sent Jesus. In other words, everything that we do in our lives must be done with a view of maintaining unity within the body. Now... In my study, I noticed something about the unity of the Father that was very interesting. The unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that was very interesting, which is called the Trinity. Now, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God and only one God, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, holy and ever-present. There is none like him. And although God is one and is set apart, he does not stand alone, nor does he live alone in isolation. We see him living in perfect unity. He is part of the Godhead. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, he gave his disciples a great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God does not live in isolation because God exists in three and one. When we think about the Holy Spirit, although he has magnanimous power, he has certain submissions. He doesn't draw his attention to himself, but his goal is to point to the Son. John tells us the Spirit comes in the Son's name, bears witness to the Son, and glorifies the Son. John 14, 26, 16, 13. The Spirit is saying, in essence, look to him, listen to him, follow him, worship him, be devoted to him, serve him, love him, be preoccupied with him. But when we look at the sun, oddly enough, we don't find him parading around saying, I am the greatest. Instead, he is saying, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. The Son submitted to the Spirit for the first three Gospels tells us it was the Spirit who sent Jesus out into the desert to be tempted by Satan. And when praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that crucifixion was near, Jesus submits to the Father. For he told the Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus, too, has the same shyness. Then there is the Father. We hear his voice in two different occasions in the gospel. One at Jesus' baptism and again at the transfiguration. Both times the words are a variation of the message. This is my priceless son. I am deeply pleased with him. Listen to him. It is worth pointing out that this voice does not say listen to me too. After listening to him, don't forget that I'm here too. Don't be taken up with my son Because God the Father is submitting also. The whole Trinity is submitting and pointing to one another in a gracious circle. So God exists as Father, Son, and Spirit in a community of greater humility, 
servanthood, mutual submission, and delight than you and I can't even imagine. Three, yet one, oneness. God exists in community throughout all eternity. God is set apart, but he does not stand alone. He models perfect community. And we learn what authentic biblical community is by the way God relates to himself. So we know that each member of the Trinity points to the other in a gracious circle. Now Jesus prays, may they be one as we are one. He's talking about us. Then he says, may they be one in us. What? That's absolutely shocking. But it is revealed in his word, Jesus invites us into the fellowship of the Trinity. Uh-huh. Me in the center of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You in the center of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I am reminded of one of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 3, 16, 19. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Oh my God, my brothers and sisters, can we imagine the kind of love that is so rooted and grounded where Christ settles down, deep down in the treasures of our heart and soul that our lives are transformed in the agape kind of love that God has through the Holy Spirit living in unity with all of the saints within the triune God. Strengthened through the indwelling Christ. Hallelujah. Through his incomprehensible love rooted and grounded in love. The very love by which God is known will flow throughout our entire being. Filling up. Filling us up with the fullness of God. This simply means that we'll be like him. That's what God wants in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, just trying to grasp that is mind-boggling. And the fulfillment of this prayer seems impossible. How can we become one? How can we become unified when we can't agree how we should worship, what hymns to sing, how long should we sing them? Huh. How can we become one? How can we become unified when everyone has a different opinion and wants their voices to be heard? How can we become one when from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock on any given Sunday, God's people effectively are separated by race, class, and culture? How can we be one when on any given Sunday morning still becomes the most segregated hour of the week? How can we become one when it matters to some of us who sits in a certain pew and who bows next to us at the altar? How can we become one when it matters to us whether we clap our hands or sway to a beat or just meditate in silence? How can we become one? Well... The answer to our problem comes 
In the answer to Jesus' prayer, Jesus prayed that, that his people would be one. And the writer of Acts tells us that the prayer was answered at least for a moment. He tells us that Jesus' followers were, were gathered in one place with one prayer and for one purpose. And first we learn that they were gathered in one place. 120 persons were drawn together by one common impulse to merge their separate existences, different races, male and female, various pursuits, divergent vocations, several movements and independent actions. They came together in one common action, together in one place, all for different reasons, motives, and excuses which would have kept them apart or caused them to be uh, at different places at, at this time in history. But they were overcome by the common reason and motive which drew them in one place. Think about it, church. Would it not be amazing that the call of God would reign supreme and, and it would start with the church of Jesus Christ. It would start with us that we might be filled with the fullness of God and the love of Christ, that we might be one that would overflow from us to the world. Oh, I guess we got to start with us to the communities before we can get to the world. But, but wouldn't it be wonderful if it could start with us? I don't know everything that happened in that upper room before the Holy Spirit came down on that 120 as they prayed together on one accord. I, I know that the only way I can value you over me is that I got to kill something in me that wants to make me value me over you. I've got to die to self. I got to seek to be a blessing to you. First, before I can try to be a blessing to me, I got to pray for you first. Hallelujah. I got to encourage you first because here is what I have discovered. When I get my eyes off of me and put of my eyes on others around me. God will take care of me. I know he will do it when I'm busy blessing somebody else, not pointing to myself. Hallelujah. God is going to take care of me anyway. Hallelujah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that things are happening even though it looks crazy all over the place. But I'm so glad that relationships are are happening. I'm so glad that that Celtic Cross and Murphy Manual are forming a relationship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the 120 were all together in one place, physically, mentally, and spiritually. But they also had one purpose, thinking they weren't thinking about their problems or what was for dinner or the plans that they had for later. Their focus was on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they at one, at one point don't know how long it took, but they were so filled, they became filled with the Holy Spirit and were able to witness to the thousands. Hallelujah. All I can see in my sanctified imagination on that day of Pentecost, they had what we refer to as Umbutu, collective consciousness is simply two or three touching and agreeing. Hallelujah, we are one. It is a dialogical in nature where we are a chain 
We're the strong, we, we are as strong as our weakest link. Oneness in our prayers, oneness in the spirit, oneness in the Lord. Hallelujah. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more. No more racial problems. No more social problems. Hallelujah. We'll be able to see the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, the beloved community right here on earth. Hallelujah. I'm looking for that day. I'm looking for that day. I'm looking for that day, for that oneness. So much so that hurt can be changed into healing. Brokenness can be transformed into wholeness. Pain can be changed into pleasure. Misery can be changed into his gladness. That confusion can be changed into his peace. That weakness can be transformed into a strength. That despair transformed into his hope. Fear transformed into his confidence. Doubt be transformed into faith. And hate, hallelujah, be changed into love. That's why God sent Jesus into the world to live and to die and be resurrected from the dead so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Looking for that day. Looking for that day. Blessed are those who hear the word and do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy
as we come together for Holy Communion. Let us uh, pray for our sins. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us, let us pray silently together. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sins. As we come together for Holy Communion, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three and following states, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Then after the supper, he took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the New Testament. For as often as you eat this bread, you do drink of this cup until my coming again. As we are in social distancing, I am reminded I, I wanted to say something else. Can we just stop right there and I'll stop, start something else? As we are in social distancing, then I want to say something else. As we are in social distancing and, and um, in, at home and staying six feet apart and all of the things that we have to do during this pandemic, we cannot come together as we had at one time. And this reminds me of a story of a preacher by the name of Thomas Pettypiece, a Methodist preacher who was among 10,000 prisoners of war. These 10,000 prisoners wanted to have communion, but there was no bread, there was no wine, there was no water. But Thomas Pettipis said that we can still have communion because it is the spirit, it is how we feel within the spirit, and we'll have communion of empty hands. And so he took the bread that was not there. He took the bread in his hands. And he broke it. The communion of empty hands. And he gave it to the others. And he said, take, eat. This is the body of Jesus. Was, was broken for you. It reminds us of his precious body that was broken on the cross. It also reminds us of hungry people all over the world who are 
hungry and those who are homeless, especially during this time of pandemic. And then he took of the empty cup and he said, take, eat, drink, ye all of it. This is his precious blood that was shed for many. And it reminds us of his precious blood that was shed. And it also reminds us of how we yearn for peace and togetherness and unity that is so much needed in this world. Drink of his precious blood that was shed for you and for many. I now take of his broken body that was broken for my sins and your sins. I now drink of his precious blood remembering his life and what he went through on the cross. Father God, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you, Lord, for sending your only begotten son into the world so that we might have an opportunity to the tree of life. We thank you, O oh God, that through his precious body and blood that we might be saved, that we might be healed, and we might be delivered. Glory to God. We give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And now, let us go into all of the world, helping the poor, supporting the weak, returning no evil for evil. And may the love of God, the graciousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in each of us now and forevermore, let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord.